LCH, that's the, the big name, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. You know, Langerhans cells are part of our body and they are very important in our immune system. On our skin, about 2% of our skin cells are Langerhans cells. So we all need Langerhans cells. They are really the cells that we need in our immune system. When something would happen on your skin, it's really the Langerhans cells who picks it up and they will go with that antigen to a lymph node where that thing is killed. So Langerhans cells are really important in our immune system. When you have Langerhans cell histiocytosis, those cells are accumulating and proliferating and they go to organs in our body where they shouldn't be and they make clumps and they sometimes even give dysfunction. So you can have it in your skin, although normally 2%, but you can have big clusters, you can have it in your bone, in your lungs, in your liver. And you can understand a liver that functions normally. However, if there are clumps of cells that shouldn't be there, you can get dysfunction of your liver. So lung hand cells is really an accumulation of proliferation of cells that are normal in our body called lung hand cells. So when we talk about the symptoms of LCH, it's important to realize where is this accumulation of these cells. You can understand when it's not only in your skin that you can have skin lesions. They're brown, they're purples. You can see it, it looks a little bit like eczema. If it's in your bone, it can be painful because then you can have a lytic lesion. It's like a little hole. It's not really a hole, but it looks like it when you make an x-ray. But then you can have pain. So it all depends which organ is involved. So again, in your skin, you can have an eczema-like symptom. In your bone, it can be painful. It can be swollen a little bit. If it's in your liver or in your lung, you can have dysfunction of the normal function of the liver of the lung. So it all depends which organ is involved. So that's sort of also the interesting part of LCH, of lung cell histiocytosis. One organ can be involved and then you have only a symptom in that organ, or your whole body, many organs can be involved and then you can be extremely sick. Then every organ can dysfunction. LCH diagnosis is really by looking and making the diagnosis with your eyes in combination with the right biopsy. So you have to take a little piece of the lesion that is involved. And again, let's talk about skin. If you have a brown papule or lesions on your skin, really a pathologist or a surgeon or a pediatrician or a dermatologist has to take a little piece of the skin. It's really tiny and you put it under the microscope and then you can look at this accumulation and proliferation of those lung hand cells. We can stain it and make it very colorful so that we can see that there are lung hand cells. So really the diagnosis is a combination of the clinical symptoms in combination with the histology. And again, we kind of talk, when we talk about treatment of LCH, it depends which organ is involved. If it's only the skin, sometimes only local application of, let's say, corticosteroids can be enough. In your bone, sometimes you need to take the biopsy to make the diagnosis. Sometimes that is enough. In some countries, we leave a little bit of corticosteroids to get the healing. But the biggest problem in LCH is when there are many organs involved. And, you know, we talk about high-risk organs when your liver, your lung, your gastrointestinal tract, or your spleen or your bone marrow can be involved. And then you can understand then it's a disseminated disease and then you have to give treatment that goes all through the body. And then we have to give chemotherapy. We know that some forms of chemotherapy are the best in this disease. So then if you are a child or if you are an adult and you need chemotherapy, most of the drugs that we give are given intravenously. So then you give systemic treatment with treatment that kills fast growing accumulating cells and then we know that the chemotherapy treats or attacks the lung on cells. Well, I always believe when you ask a question, is it hereditary or genetic, you know, we are all susceptible and there are people are more susceptible for asthma and I think now that we know more and more from LCH we know that there can be a certain gene mutated. Um, so is it genetic? Yeah, in part it is. In 50, 55%, there is this, this specific gene mutated. 
Hello. However, that doesn't mean that it is hereditary. It doesn't mean that some families it will happen more often. You know, when you look in the whole world with seven billion people, there might be five families where there is more than one family member um, affected with the disease. So that does happen, but um, some things do happen. So if we really go short to the question, it's not hereditary, but there isn't genetic form. We are finding more genes, and again, it's, I, I call it more susceptible. Some people are more susceptible to get asthma. Some people. So here we find an abnormality in the lung on cells. And it's my strong feeling that in the future we'll find more genetic abnormalities. So is there a cure for LCH? We're still trying to find what is the cause. And we now know a little bit that there might be a genetic abnormality. I clearly feel there is a cure for this disease. Um, in the localized form, so only skin and bone, um, you know, we cure them all. Sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it takes shorter. There is a high percentage of relapse, of reactivation, which is very problematic for the patient and for the families. In the disseminated form, we cure 80, 90 percent, which is very high. However, that doesn't mean that we can cure 100 percent, so there are still patients who really suffer and who pass away of this disease. So if, the, is there, if people ask me, is there a cure? Yes, there is a cure, but it's not 100% yet, and we are all working together to find the best treatment possible. We came a long way, but we aren't there yet, so we have to improve our, our treatment. Um, you know, we work together internationally. I think that if we look at the treatment that we have developed for lung ulcer, histiosatosis, there are now Almost every country in the world can participate in the international studies. And we're still trying to fine tune. Is six months of treatment less good than 12 months of treatment? Or maybe we have to go to 24 months of treatment? Does it mean that those reactivations that I'm talking about, will they disappear if we treat longer? So yes, we can cure it. We are not there yet where we would like to be. And um, that's why we're still working on it. So the possibilities are, um, I think it's a little bit higher to reactivate in this disease than many other diseases. Um, we are looking at it, is it immunologic driven? Is, are there other things to cause that it reactivates? We think, and I think that in the localized form, it's about 20% chance of reactivation. In the disseminated form, it's about 40% of chances of reactivation. But the problem is always, you know, we can talk about chances, but for every patient, it either reactivates or doesn't reactivate. So for every patient, it's 100% or 0%. So if we really talk for 100 patients, if you had 100 patients in the room, we could say in a single system, 20% will go to the next room where it will reactivate. And in a disseminated form, it might be in 40 patients. So it does reactivate. And I think it has to do with the immune system that we're still trying to fine tune which of the patient I predict that in the future we'll find little markers that say here the chances of reactivations are higher and maybe in the next course of chemotherapy or in treatment we will say if you have this certain marker and your chances of reactivation is higher that we have to go to longer treatment to diminish the chances of reactivation. You know, the question of reimmunization is a very important, immune, uh, uh, an important question. We always ask this question with every child who gets treatment. And, um, you know, most of the patients with LCH are treated by, by physicians who also treat patients with malignancies, with leukemia, for example. And I think if you look at the treatment and the reimmunization, it's very similar. And I always say six months to 12 months after stopping the chemotherapy, you should reimmunize your child. If you don't reimmunize your child, the chances of other diseases is very high. And then, you know, we always say six to 12 months after stopping chemotherapy, your immune system is back to normal, and then it's good to get reimmunization. I think that um, for a very long time, and I'm talking when I was still wet behind my ears, we were sort of struggling. And it is now, you know, this year we had the 29th meeting of the Histiocyte Society. 
where we're always struggling, where is the histocyte society? Where are those diseases? Are they malignancies like leukemia or are they immune diseases, inflammation? So at a certain point, there was a development that people like myself said, let's join and develop a society that only is focusing on the histocytic disorders. And at the same point, there were families who were, had a child who was struggling with the disease and who developed a sort of a family association where there was advocacy, where people are starting to help. And I think this is an, an, a unique example where physicians and scientists on the one side and families or an association for families, from families who are working together because we can only go further in this disease, meaning cure it if we work together. And I think that um, for me, being a big part of the history of society and for a long part, um, part of the association, I think this has been very important because we cannot do all the things that we want to do with, uh, with only the physicians, the interaction with the association and the people who are really moving the field, who are there to ask the questions, who are also important to raise money for research because you know, the treatment of today is good for the patient of today, but we can only improve if we do research and that will be for the patient of tomorrow. And I think that all the research that has been done has been funded for 80 to 90% by the hard work of the family associations like the Histiosotosis Association of America. So I think we are thankful, and I'm sure the association is thankful that there are physicians who devote a good part of the work on working with patients with histiosotosis. So I think that um, we are a very good and strong family together. We have a good relationship. You know, we have about, every, every human being has about 35,000 genes. And what we are seeing is it's actually amazing that there are not more problems in every life. Because I think that every disease, and let's call about, you know, neoplasms, is a combination of um, genetic abnormalities and environment. You know, when you live close to Chernobyl, radiation can, can break things, but there can also spontaneous, spontaneous mutations can occur. And in LCH, we know there is a certain mutation in 55% of the patients in a specific genus called BRAF. It's a very complex um, downstream of genes. However, if this is mutated, you get accumulation of lung on cells. So we now know that this is one cause of LCHs. However, if there are 45% of the patients who do not have BRAF mutations, it's not the only answer. I am convinced that we will find more mutations. And again, a mutation is nothing else that certain cells get a signal. Normally, they divide very slow in two cells. Now they get a an, an signal that they have to divide fast. So if you have two lung hole cells normally, you get a signal that you have to divide more faster. You get an accumulation of the lung hole cells. That in combination with why do cells go to the skin or to the bone, and that's one of the things that's still the black box. We're looking to see, is the BRAF already enough? I don't think so. People are developing a mouse model where they are developing with the mutation to see, can we mimic the disease so we can improve our treatment? But we are not successful, so there's probably more than just this point mutation, this in uh, BRAF. It's extremely complex. I work in this field for 30 years, and every time that I hear about it, I can follow it. But if you're not a microbiologist or a geneticist, it's extremely difficult. Again, these are all the pieces of the jigsaw lung cancer histiosis. And you know, when I started 30 years ago, we probably had nothing. We have the boundaries, we have big spots of the puzzle, and BRAF is really a big spot that we are filling, um, essential in the further development, and probably also very in, um, important at a certain point in getting improvement of treatment, because there are now drugs that are targeting specific to the BRAF mutation. So um, I can predict that in the next five to 10 years, our treatment will be much more targeted, maybe on the BRAF mutation, but again, it also has to go very slow because we don't want to make mistakes, but big accomplishments in the last 
two, three years, that we now know at least for 40, 50% of the patients that there is a specific genetic abnormality.